So everyone, welcome to our uh, this week's BPP seminar series. Uh, so today we have two speakers. Uh, the first is Gregor, uh, second is Elizabeth. So Gregor, now it's your turn. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our research. Today I will talk about unraveling multiple mechanisms of long non coding RNA regulation through transcriptional stochasticity. And so basically cells have to have the ability to sense different signals and then respond to them. And one of the fundamental biological process that enables cells to make that happen is changes in gene expression. And this is a fundamental process that is important from simple bacteria to us humans. And so just to recap, um, gene regulation is a process by which proteins bind to a specific DNA sequence called the promoter, which is in front of a gene. And these proteins then turn on the gene, which makes RNA and the RNA gets then translated. This is commonly known as the central dogma of biology. However, in the past, a lot of focus has been on these genes that encode proteins, but over the last 10, 15 years, it became much more appreciated that large part of the human genome does actually uh, not encode for protein, but for RNA. And in the human genome, only 3% of the DNA actually encodes for proteins, whereas another 60% is our non-coding RNAs. And so these non-coding RNAs are not only found um, in human cells, but they are also found in simple eukaryotes, such, such as yeast cells. And when I was a postdoc in Alexander van Ordner, and we had a collaboration with Angelica Ammons lab, where we looked at long non-coding RNA regulation during meiosis, and we found that the act of transcription of a transcript called IRT1 in the promoter region of a central regulator of meiosis, IME1, um, is actually regulating this, re this gene through a process by which the polymerates read through this promoter region and then recruits chromatin remodeling proteins that silence or activate the gene. So in my own lab at Vanderbilt, we started to continue working on this long non-coding RNAs, but we actually wanted to study this in higher eukaryotic cells and we focused on X chromosome inactivation, which is a model system for understanding how genes are inactivated by a long non-coding RNA called Exis. And a common example in the textbook is this checkered pattern of a fork of a cat in which the different colors of the four correspond to genes on one or the other X chromosome in these female uh, cats that get expressed. <clears throat> and so the system um, is studied well in mouse embryonic stem cells and has been studied over many decades now. And so the power of the system is that many different mechanisms have been proposed. And these can be generally grouped into mechanisms that are based on transcripts and are mechanisms that are based on the act of transcription. However, each of these different mechanisms have been studied by different labs with different techniques, and nobody has really compared the different um, methodologies or um, mechanisms of regulation. And this is a, an important problem because it would allow us to study long non-coding RNAs in a fairly unbiased way. And this is important to understand many other of these long non-coding RNAs that we mechanistically cannot study or very hard to study. So the three transcript-based mechanisms that have been often proposed are a mechanism by which Exis binds to T6, so Exis um, is a long non-coding RNA that silences the X chromosome, and it's regulated by an antisense transcript called T6. Um, so the model here is that Exis and T6 bind together, which then triggers degradation of these uh, complex. Another model that has been proposed is an Exis and T6 bind together, which would prevent proteins from actually binding to Exis, and then this would change gene expression. Or Another mechanism is that T6 somehow recruits a protein that then can bind to the promoter region of the axis and then changes gene regulation. These mechanisms of transcript-based regulations for long coding RNA has been uh, popularized a lot in mammalian cells 
But in the yeast cells, we did not really, people have not really found these um, mechanism of the transcript-based regulation. Whereas in the yeast system, uh, transcription interference, which is a process by which the sense and the antisense transcript initiate transcription where as polymerases read through this um, genomic region and then collide. And then it's either one or the other polymerase uh, wins. And the other method or the other um, mechanism of regulation is chromatin modifications that are introduced in the beginning where transcription of a polymerase recruits chromatin regulating proteins, which then change the locus. And so we wanted to look at all of these mechanisms um, together and um, very talented graduate student in the lab has actually did all the experiment and the quantitative analysis um, in the studies that I will present now. So in order to test the first two models, we designed, we used a method called RNA, single molecule RNA fish, which is basically a method that enables in fixed cells to detect individual transcripts in a cell. And the design that we chose is that we uh, generated probes that bind onto the exonic sequences of Xs on the exonic sequences of T6. And there's also a short transcript in the beginning of Xs, which is called rep A, um, that can also be transcribed. And so the hypothesis is that Xs, if Xs and T6 can bind together, then one would should see a signal in which there is a high degree of co-localization resulting in these kind of white spots. Um, but if Xs and T6 do not bind together, then you see either one or the other color. And the same opposite is true for rep A. If rep A, Xs and T6 bind together, the rep A probes cannot bind because the T6 prevents the binding. Um, and if T6 does not bind, there should be high level of co-localization between rep A and Xs. And so in order to quantify this, we use the particle correlation spectroscopy methodology that have been previously developed for single molecules. And this methods allow us to quantify the fraction of co-localized spots. And the way of how this works is that we take a transcript of interest, here's a black dot, and we look at what is the probability of finding um, another RNA on the, in the other channel within a radius around the spot here in the middle. And we then calculate the average co-localization. As we increase the radius, the fraction of co-localized spot increases until we reach basically a random co-localization based on the background. And we then can interpolate this uh, gradual increase here to zero and get the co-localization fraction. If you now take these measurements and we randomize the position of the two transcripts um, as a control, we would see that there is no co-localization and the increase would be basically on the random co-localization we would expect. So what we see is just by visualization is that Xs and Rep A actually co-localize to a high degree, whereas this Xs and T6 do not co-localize at all. Um, so this basically enabled us to then exclude the first two mechanisms, which are based on two transcripts that bind to each other. In the next method, we looked at um, transcription in the cells, and the idea was if T6 recruits a regulatory protein that then regulate Xs, the expression pattern between Xs and T6 should be different than what you would expect by random. And so what we did here is we quantified um, Xs and T6 expression in single cells in several replica experiments and plotted the joint probability distribution of the expression of these two transcripts. From this, we see um, a low correlation for the first two replicas. What we then do is we randomize the relationship between the two transcripts in the data and generate a joint probability from this random distribution. And then we use a two-dimensional KS test to compare the measure to the randomized distribution. And what we find is that there's no difference between the measured and the randomized distribution. So based on this measurements, we can also exclude the third mechanism that is transcription-based. So we see simple experiments. We have now shown that none of these transcript-based mechanisms are actually valid. Next, we went into uh, the process of transcription interference. And so what we did is we used the same images, but now we focused on nascent transcription. And the idea is that if there is transcription interference, 
then you should either see excess or T6 expression at the site of transcription, which are these very bright spots here. Whereas um, if there is no transcription interference, then you should so you should see co-expression of both of these transcripts. So we then quantified nascent transcription at the nascent access and T6 locus in three replica experiment. And then again, use this randomization of the data to generate distribution and then did a two dimensional KS test. And we see that there is a statistically significant difference between the measured and the randomized distribution indicating that transcription interference could happen here. So in order to better understand this transcription interference mechanism in more detail and to have a, um, a quicker readout of the transcription process, we focused on RNA fish probes that can bind on the intronic sequences um, of the axis and the T6 transcript. And the idea here is that introns are only detected when they when this um, transcript are actively transcribed, but then when the transcript is fully transcribed and spliced, the introns should not be visible anymore. And we see here when we measure excess introns and excess exons that there is uh, this large cloud for the excess transcripts, but there's only this one spot here in the middle that localizes to the nascent transcription of excess. So what we then did is we designed <clears throat> different set of probes. First, we designed exonic, intronic probe for excess and for T6 that spend the same genomic location and they are interleaved. So this means they cover the same genomic um, re region um, at this locus. And what we will expect is that if there's transcription interference that we only see one of the, or one or the other color expressed. But if there's no transcription interference, we should also see co-localization. And this is indeed what we see here in this image. Um, the same is true if we use actually uh, probes that are in the five prime sequence of the T6, which is basically this beginning of the T6 transcript that does not overlap with the excess um, transcript. And the idea of, and the reason for designing the probes in this way is that one could expect that even with transcription interference that you get expression for excess and for T6 um, in this particular region here. And so with transcription interference, we would basically get expression of both. Without transcription interference, we could see one or the other. And we actually see this co-localization here too. But again, this is just a single cell. And so in really to understand this mechanism in detail, we then analyzed many of these uh, joint probability distributions, <clears throat> either for excess with a five prime T6 transcripts or excess with a three prime T6 transcripts. And then again, we use the randomization of the um, data to basically get a joint probability distribution of randomly expressed excess and T6. And what we find is that uh, these two distributions are statistically significant different, indicating that transcription interference should actually happen at this locus. So the question is, why is it that the, some of the images show that there is transcription interference versus other images show that there's no transcription interference? So when you look at this joint probability distribution, you also appreciate that there is actually tremendous variability in the expression. So there are cells in which there's low level of T6 expression, medium level of T6 expression, high level of T6 expression. The same is true for the actually excess transcript. And so what we then thought is, can we actually take this data and bin the data into low, medium, and high expressing cells to see if these correlations and co-localization measurements that we see actually hold true at different expression levels. And so what you see here is, the um, on top in the top row is a excess co-localization with a three prime T6 probe. So these are these interleaf probes. Um, and then the five prime end probes are here outside the transcript. And what we then do is we do a co-localization between excess and T6. And what we basically find is that at low and at medium expression, there is no difference in the co-localization fractions between um, T6 three prime co localization with excess and T6 five prime co localization with excess. However, indicating that for low and medium expression, we do not see transcription difference. 
But at high nascent transcription of access, we see that the three prime um, co-localization events is much lower compared to the five prime co-localization event. And this is an observation that is consistent with the transcription interference because one can start transcribing the five prime end and then when the transcript actually reads the gene body, then there should be transcription interfering coming from the access expression. So this shows that transcription variability <clears throat> enables us to actually probe different mechanism in the regulation of access and transcript. And this is this concept that there's actually multiple processes, multiple mechanisms happening in the same locus, depending on the nascent transcription is a fairly novel way of thinking about mechanisms of regulation. And so we then wanted to better understand the slow and uh, medium transcription. And so what we then um, basically summarize at this point is that transcription interference is happening, but only at high transcription level. And so we then wanted to test is actually the, the proposed mechanism that we introduced earlier that the polymerase recruits chromatin remodeling complexes that then can change the um, chromatin environment, make histone modification, and in this way, impact axis and T6 regulation. And so what we did is um, that we used the immunofluorescence for a specific histone mark, which is the H3K36 ME3 mark. And this is um, a mark that get deposited when a polymerase reads through a gene that then recruits chromatin remodeling complexes such as ZD2, which is a homologue of the Z2 uh, protein in yeast, which I studied during my postdoc. And so what we did in these experiments, we took the antibody concentration, so we have a primary antibody and a secondary antibody for detection, and we used the primary antibody to actually dilute the concentration of the antibody. And what you then observe is as you dilute the antibody, that these individual cyan spot appear here in the cell. And this is one slice out, out of an image stack um, that we take. And this immunofluorescence can be then combined with uh, RNA fish. So we can actually then measure excess expression, T6 expression, and the histone marks. And because now we observe individual punctae, which we think are specific sequences in which the histone um, H3K36 is methylated um, three times, we can then use our spot detection algorithm that we use for RNA fish spot detections to actually quantify immunofluorescence. <clears throat> and so the hypothesis is that then if there is uh, H3K mediated inhibition, that there should be high co-localization of this mark with low expression of excess and low co-localization of this mark with high expression of excess. Uh, vice versa, um, for T6, as proposed from the literature, low co-localization um, of the H3, um, H3K36 and H3 mark correspond to low expression of T6 and high co-localization of this mark correspond to high expression of T6. Um, but if there is um, no um, H3K36 inhibition, then we would basically expect that a low co-localization of the mark correspond to low expression of excess and high co-localization correspond to high expression of excess. And the same is true for T6. So we, because we have these spots now, we use the same co-localization analysis that we used before, analyzing the data, then generating a random data set um, and measuring co-localization. And then we divide the measure to the randomized data and we get a fold enrichment as a function of the distance. And with this kind of metric, we can now actually quantify what is the fold enrichment of the system mark depending how far we are away from the site of transcription. And so what we observe is that T6 that co-localizes um, with access shows low co-localization with the histone mark at low expression shows then high co-localization enrichment at medium transcription and then again lower um, co-localization at higher nascent transcription. For access, we observe um, 
some co-localization at low and medium expression, but no co-localization at high expression. And so because we measure axis um, and T6 together with the histone mark in the same cell, and we have measured actually many cells, we can then look at the joint expression of axis and T6. Again, bin at uh, low, medium, and high levels for axis and for T6. Um, and what we then do is we look for what is the co-localization in each of these different bins with this H3K36 mark, and then we compare that to randomized co-localization. And what we find is that at this intermediate transcription of axis and T6, we have an 11-fold higher co-localization compared to random. But this co-localization um, is not as high in any of the other combinations of transcription, indicating that intermediate transcription of axis and T6 lead to high deposition of the system mark. Um, and this observation is independent if you look at the axis T6 transcription side or the axis transcription side. So in summary, um, we find that at high axis expression, there is transcription interference ha happening um, as well as at high T6 expression. But at intermediate expression of axis and T6, the act of transcription can actually deposit these uh, chromatin mark. And there has been, there's evidence in the literature from structural biology studies that um, polymerase can actually um, read through the DNA, but do not lose the histone, uh, which we think is happening at this intermediate region. Whereas at the high expression of T6 or axis, where you have this transcription interference event, most likely many polymerases read through these locus in a high um, frequency, which then leads to uh, ejection of the histone, which would then also explain why there is much lower um, co-localization of the system mark at high expression. At the end, I'd like to thank um, Ben, who did um, all the experiment as well as developed um, all the data analysis um, and the image processing for doing this quantification. Um, the work in yeast was in collaboration with Angelica Amon's lab, and we also had another study with Gary Fink's lab on another long known coding RNAs. And cell lines has been, have been kindly provided by Jenny T. Lee, uh, Ruby D., uh, Rudolf Jenisch, and your script now. Um, and we are supported by um, several grants, and I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gugger. Um, yeah, we have plenty of time. So uh, um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat box. Um, so if you have anyone have questions, you can just turn on your uh, microphone, camera, and can ask you uh, directly. Sorry. Hi, Gregor. Uh, I, I want to ask how uh, specific you think this is in the sense that if it's not specifically a long non-coding RNA, but simply two uh, promoters that are facing each other, do you think this effect also happens? Um, can you be a little bit more specific? What uh, yeah, you mean? So, so the, 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 the fact that when you have high transcription, uh, you get interference, but if you have medium transcription, you don't interfere with the with the histones. This seems like it could be something more general, right? Not specifically to having uh, non-coding, but just also in any kind of genes, this could happen. Yes, right? yes, I think this is a general a general potential mechanism for uh, any gene that has stochasticity in expression, and that would enable uh, high transcription. And so the, the interesting thing is also that in the past, people basically say it's one mechanism versus another mechanism, but this is often based on genetic studies, which are very important, but often the promoters that are used are very highly expressing promoters, such as a TED promoter or a GAL promoter. So in yeast, for example, people have made a synthetic construct with two GAL promoter facing each other, and they show that there's transcription interference, but 
as you know, the GAL promoter is like one of the highest expressing promoters in yeast cells. And the same goes for the access system. Um, people have used the TET inducible promoter system and then show transcription interference, but it's a very artificial system. So our analysis of actually analyzing nascent transcription in an endogenous locus um, can be basically applied to any gene for which you can make RNA fish probes and that has stochasticity in expression. And it can be, of course, combined with genetics if one prefers to do that. And the other thing is the amino fluorescence um, is also interesting because what we did is compared to most other people is we actually start to dilute the antibody to a different concentration than the manufacturer recommends. So if you usually use this amino fluorescence or you look in the papers, there's big chunks in the nucleus that are just bright for this histone mark. But I think the problem or the reason for that is that the antibody concentration is often too high and you actually saturate. And, and this is why you don't see the spots. And if you actually start to dilute out the primary antibody, then you should be able to actually see this punk guy. So I want to follow this, Gregor. Can we go back to your previous slide? Um, so, yeah, this one, I think this is also what Joan uh, pointed to. So I, you know, since I haven't uh, followed this uh, field for a while, so I want to, to, uh, to get a physical picture. So I think that here is a, you know, there are several processes going on, right? You have a once transcription, you need to remove this uh, histone uh, and, and also uh, then also be affected by this uh, histone modification. Um, well, right, there's competing process, right? Well, the, uh, their, their enzyme try to add a nucleus of uh, histone. So can you kind of summarize all those processes, how they may help us to, to understand this, why yeah. at different uh, transcription rates, you may have different uh, dynamics. Yes. So, <clears throat> so I think it's very well established these days from um, many single cell studies, particularly the ones pioneered um, Alexander van Odenaren's lab and um, Elowitz lab that there is stochasticity in gene expression. And this basically leads to um, the initiation of polymerases at a specific gene. And this initiation can be highly variable. So there is within the same genetically identical population, you can have cells in which, for example, one polymerase gets loaded onto the, um, like basic initiates and reads through the, um, through the gene locus. And then there are cells in which you have multiple polymerases reading through 10, 20 polymerases. Um, and this has been shown in yeast, but also in higher eukaryotic cells as well as in bacteria. Um, and so this is a general property of gene regulation in single cells. So in the past, people thought that if a polymerase reads through the gene locus, it should basically somehow collide with nucleosomes. Um, and usually people think that there's chromatin there are proteins that can um, basically remove nucleosomes or they can alter tails on the histones that makes them easier to remove or more difficult to remove, meaning you have a more compact chromatin versus a more open chromatin. But then, um, but then there's also conflicting data that basically shows that you can have high, they can have transcription and you can have these histones on the DNA. And so people started to ask the question, how can this be that the polymerase reads through, but we also have histones on there. And so recently, through the advancement of electron microscopy, people have actually looked at this where they had purified nucleosomes together with DNA and polymerase and basically um, initiate transcription in vitro and then um, did electron microscopy to see where the polymerase sits on the DNA and where's the histone. And um, they basically showed that there are situations in which you have this histone octamere, which are basically two parts and the, DNA, the polymerase can actually unwrap one half of the DNA from the nucleosome. Um, and then the nucleum switches, loads on the, DNA after the polymerase reads through the first 
um, part of the histone, then the DNA that is comes out of the or gets passed by the uh, polymerase get then can bind to the histone again, and then the second half of the histone gets unwind. Um, and then in this way, the polymerase actually can read through this locus and pass histones without actually ejecting them. Um, yeah. But but of course, you can imagine that if you have now multiple polymerases that read one after another, that maybe this affinity to the DNA is not so strong anymore because now only half the DNA on the, that can bind around the histone is actually bound. And therefore it can completely eject um, the histone. And this would be consistent with this model of transcription interference where you have high transcription of the polymerases. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, I know so Brian has a question, but we have reached uh, um, 11.30. So uh, how about Brian, you hold your question uh, at the end. Um, okay, uh, Greg, thank you uh, for a very nice talk.